Ja, hallo zu dem nächsten Stream, der diesmal über unsere Versorgung geht. Und zwar geht es genau um Rico. Das ist eine Graswurzelbewegung aus Finnland, die Konsumenten und die Produzenten zusammenbringt auf kleiner Ebene, um dort eine neue Art von Einfluss auf den Markt zu gewähren. Julia wird gleich diesen Talk in Englisch halten. Ähm, Anschließend gibt es noch ein kleines Q&A, das ist dann in dem Raum Ada, da müsst ihr dann rüber wechseln. Um, the following talk will be held in English. Um, the talk is about RICO, it's an agricultural grassroot movement from Finland. Um, it brings together consumers and the producers of the goods on a direct way without the mean of market as um, a stop in between. And I uh, I hope you have a lot of uh, information in this talk and now let's start let's start with it. So, hi everyone. My name is Julia Westwork and I would like to talk about how to hack agriculture today. Well, more specifically about how to create small scale self-administrated farmer markets. And the concept is called RECO. So, let's have a look. Uh, very shortly about me, I'm an environmental scientist and engineer living in Sweden on a small farm, growing a few vegetables, having some chickens, and I have been organizing a Rico group for the last three years. Um, my favorite vegetable to grow is pumpkin and eggplants, and yeah, so um, farming is an interest of mine, but I'm not a professional farmer or doing that full time. I will get back to that uh, detail later. And um, what is RECO? Well, RECO means real consumption, or could translate to real consumption. And um, it is a concept that came originally from Finland, but uh, has by now spread to almost all of Scandinavia. I have a small map there that sadly only includes the Swedish markets. We, I don't, didn't find go a good comprehensive map that includes Finland and Norway as well. Um, the basic ingredients of a Reiko market or Reiko group, how I refer to them, is the direct contact between the customer and the person that produced the food. So it is a small grassroots movement. So it started from farmers and um, it's basically very unrestricted growing food, selling it directly to people that want to eat it. And um, there is no actual transactions or, well, there is no selling at the meetings. The selling happens before online. And that is why it doesn't fall under restrictions of farmers' markets. Um, because if you want to sell, at least in Scandinavia, if you want to sell on a farmers' market, that is quite a lot of effort to meet, to like um, get certifications and to meet certain requirements. And that is hard for small scale farmers or, for example, for people that just have a big garden and uh, some overproduction. So that makes RECO different and uh, interesting. So RECO groups are self-organized and um, they're independent of each other. So as you can see on the map, <laughs> there's quite a few. Um, though they're independent of each other, there is a national wide community for support. So a lot of the people that help administrating those groups are then in a bigger group where they can all talk about issues that have occurred in their groups or ask how other groups handle situations. But it is important to point out that every group makes their own rules and um, decides how to handle things on their own. Um, there is a bit of help, like for example, there has been um, gra material for, for example, the graphical stuff available from uh, yeah, people that wanted to share that. And um, then there is, of course, experience from neighbor communities normally that we can turn to and ask for help. Um, but essentially, every small RECO group is a bunch of people deciding that, hey, our village or our town should have something like this. Let's do it. 
So, I mean, why should you have something like this? You want something like this because you want to know where your tomato is coming from, right? Um, or at least I think that's starting to get more important for people again. So for the consumer here, um, and with the consumer, I mean, that is, well, you that's wanting to buy tomatoes. Uh, it's really easy to get super fresh seasonal food because the farmers are selling what they have produced this week, maybe even that day. Uh, and you can meet the producer. Like, you know that Lars has been growing your tomatoes and uh, you know how Lars is actually what Lars... You can ask Lars what is he using for treatments on his tomato plants. Is he using any pesticides? And um, that makes it really interesting. And you get unique products. So the farmer maybe wants to try new sorts or specializes in old sorts that are really hard to get by. And so you can get really this unique products that are really interesting and make for uh, except exceptional food. But a supermarket wouldn't be able to provide you with that because then a supermarket needs to provide thousands of it. And another plus side is really short transportations. Reiko is very much built on local. So hopefully the tomatoes that you're buying are just coming from the village next, well, next door, basically. And that also means that there's a lot less waste. You don't need to package things in plastic. You can recycle. You can recycle bags. And um, yeah, it, it just makes it a lot more efficient. And why should you do it? Why should you do it as a farmer? Well, as a farmer, you have the, you have, a, it's really, it's an easy way to get started. For example, if we stay with the tomatoes, maybe someone just has had a lot of tomatoes one year and wants to try how is working out selling the tomatoes and not just um, giving them away for free. And uh, it's, it doesn't cost anything to sell food in a regular group. So you can just put out your tomatoes and be like, hi, I'm selling tomatoes. And um, that can be the start. It is also quite time efficient because there's no middleman. You don't need to meet up with someone else first and then they will give it to the customer. You meet directly up with your customer and uh, handing them the, um, the food that they have been buying from you. So that's very practical. Another point is that you can easily sell to positive customers. And that might be not as an um, self-explanatory as the other ones, because the positive attitude towards food, I think, is really can be really motivated for farmers and small-scale farmers that work really hard for the products. They are not <laughs> normally quite... Uh, yeah, driven people that really want to have, provide great food. And uh, it's really amazing when you can then actually sell it to people that are equally interested. So that, yeah, that's quite cool. And you can also try out new products quite easily. So you can tell, you can grow this specific kind of vegetable or you can try to make this specific kind of cheese. And then you can see, are people interested? Is it worth, worth actually producing that permanently? Or, well, didn't it really turn out that great and people didn't, weren't interested? Then it's not the end of the world because you can just, you just make a small trial run. And the last thing on here on the slides, but of product planning is uh, important as well. Because when the, the Reiko groups, you know in advance how actually how much you're going to sell that day. And um, that makes it a lot easier to plan. And on the other side, it also the groups can help you, like I said, with overproduction. So if you have a lot more then you can just try to sell it over the group a bit easier than other with uh, supermarkets. So, yeah, that is basically a lot of very, very positive things with the record groups. And um, let's have a look. Oh, it's on the next slide. There. Um, 
Yeah, so the RIG group that I have been administrating is in a small village called Herby. Uh, it's a lower income area, quite conservative structures. And by 2021, we have 21, uh, yeah, 2,130 members. And we started in 2019. So, um, why did I mention small village, low income area conservative structures? Well, basically to tell you that if it works in Herbie, it can work almost everywhere. <laughs> um, because of the structures here, people are not, it's not, it's not a hip area. It's not where like ecological food is dri driving force. It's not like that. But like I mentioned earlier, Rico groups make it possible to connect with people and to connect to food producers from the area. And I think that that is really important and that that has made a big impact. And when we started in 2019, there were basically, we were standing with five people that grew a bit of food and uh, maybe 10 people that felt a bit sorry, so they came. But consistency and getting out the word, basically telling everyone that they should check out this group, and uh, that paid off. So that is what's um, quite quite a success, I would say. Um, although there is, of course, it's not really always just easy. What was really important for this group was to get a diversity in products. And that can be a bit difficult because, well, people want to buy more than just tomatoes. So to get farmers interested that sell different products is really crucial for these kind of groups to work. Uh, here's a <laughs> small comparison that hopefully illustrates that despite having, um, well, not as well as felt the parking lot uh, in 2020, we actually had gotten a lot bigger from just 2019 to 2020. I realized I didn't have a good picture from 21, so this needed to do. Um, yeah, and one of the important things here that, yeah, people talk with each other and like you see, the farmers are actually coming in their cars and just delivering the pro products. So because there can't be any official um, sales on the spot, you don't need any market stands or anything like that. You just need a kind of fast meetup. Normally the meetings are around 30 minutes, sometimes an hour, exchange products. People may make sure everyone has paid and um, then you're good to go. So it's also rather the real, the in-person meetings are rather, are rather fast. And <laughs> talking a bit about challenges. Well, like I said, Reiko is based on online that people make their orders. So um, I have this first point, accessibility, but I could also easily name that in choosing the right platform. Um, in Sweden, most of the RECO groups are Facebook organized, which, uh, <laughs> well, is not optimal, but it is very easy accessible for most people. And uh, we have been we have been trying to tr find a better working platform to find a better working solution, and haven't really succeeded so far. The point is also that a lot of customers for these Riku groups, at least in the rural areas and on the countryside, are like fifty and upwards, and not very technical interested. So basically, yeah, the internet itself was a big step for these people. And now they have slowly understood how well this one platform works. So it's what works for them. And um, yeah, that's definitely a really big challenge because it uh, makes 
the movement quite dependent on this platform, which is definitely not ideal. Another challenge can be payment, payment methods. In Sweden, we have a system that makes it very easy to transfer money between people with um, wireless. But I know that, for example, in Germany, that's not as easy. Um, we have a bit of cash that people, that people can normally pay in cash as well, but basically no one wants to do it anymore. Um, but making sure payment works is a thing. And, uh, well, a lot is really based on trust. So upholding trust is also very important within those groups. And you need to have a good location because when you're meeting, there's like I said, like 25 producers can easily can, so 25 farmers coming and then maybe 100 people and a, on a, on a day that on an evening, that, that's quite, quite good, um, quite good, but that also needs space and, um, yeah, you need to make sure that you have a place where it's okay to park for half an hour, an hour, and to have this amount of people, of course. But we found that rather um, easy because there was a lot of, um, yeah, companies or just institutions that were like, oh, yeah, right, we have a big parking lot, you can use that. So ask around and uh, while asking around, I mean, then it's also <laughs> very easy to talk to people and just tell them about this group and try to spread the word. And that comes to another challenge, which is, yeah, getting the ball rolling, really getting around the information, let people know that this group exists, let other farmers know that this group exists, but as well tell People, everyday people, your parents, your grandmother, your neighbor, your colleague, tell everyone that these groups exist and um, spread the word. And uh, one last point of challenges is keeping transport efficient. Because the more the group grows, the further farmers kind of are willing to drive to sell the products if you have a very successful group, maybe let's say 50 kilometers away, maybe it starts to get interesting to be to actually go there. And I think it is important to stay true to the values of efficient transportation and by that a quite low CO2 um, emission by making sure that transport is managed efficiently and with as little resources as possible. But I mean, here it's here it's uh, absolutely possible to find flexible solutions. Maybe some farmers actually can take a ride, hitch a ride together or something like that. And I know that there is also ha there have been groups that have restricted farmers to a certain range around um, the town or village they are from to make sure that it really stays local. And Talking about those res uh, restricting someone, normally those Riku groups are really open, but of course it is a bit of a, a bit difficult where you draw the line for small scale production and wh yeah, when is a farmer maybe too big, maybe too, uh, too much into the conversional production to really still should be a part of it. That is definitely um, an issue that needs to be addressed within the group. But normally you have more than one person managing a group. And like I said, there is a support net. So uh, you're not alone with this kind of decisions. So what I want to say is build more Reiko. Maybe try to actually get it to Germany. Try to uh, get it going there. It's basically quite easy to start. You need to have a look into local laws and regulation. <laughs> I was hoping I could do that before this talk, but I realized that my knowledge of German law is, um, well, <laughs> yeah, not, not sufficient for that task. Um, but have a look. I really want to believe that there is a way to make it work. And then choose a communication platform. Choose a good platform. and. 
be aware that most likely the platform you choose from the start will be the platform that you will use for this group onwards. Um, we have had a few groups in Sweden that try to change communication platform after a while, and that was very hard for them. So be mindful about it and, um, yeah, think about it. And then, <laughs> of course, you need to have farmers that are interested in being a part of it. And you need to have farmers that want to sell their goods and that are, well, motivated to be a part of a really, really cool thing. And like I said before, you want to have a wide range of products and producers. So the more diversity, the better. Um, of course, there is always um, seasonal changes. And for example, my <laughs> tomato example is kind of a bad example because there's just a so short time in the year where actually local farmers can provide tomatoes, of course. But find the find farmers that are interested and then talk about what products are possible. Uh, we have realized that farmers are very often just very resourceful of finding alternatives to what they can sell in the winter and um, that there is a lot of innovation actually coming from that. That is uh, really cool to see. And yeah, that's basically what you need for starting a Riku group. Um, there would definitely be the possibility to get support from the Scandinavian communities and uh, see how they're doing and then um, maybe, yeah, try to start your own thing. And um, <laughs> I realize I'm actually today super fast with this talk. So I'm already at my sources. Uh, so I was thinking of actually skipping bit, a bit backwards to... Um, that's to, to my fifth slide. And um, talk a bit, more, a bit more about the impacts for both farmer, for the farmers. And that is, we have noticed that a really strong, um, a really strong, a bit unexpected force that happened with these groups is the networking effect because it helps small scale farmers and people that are just hobby producers to connect and to meet once, twice a week on this, on, on this group meetings give their product to the customer and then maybe stay five or 10 more minutes and just chat with each other and be like, oh, how is this going? Oh, how do you deal with that? How are your chickens doing? And while that sounds a bit trivial, but it actually makes a lot of difference because it helps people to connect with their neighbors, their a bit more far away neighbors, uh, with people that have an similar interest in producing really great food and it creates a community that is really really resourceful supporting and um, inclusive and I found that really interesting that even in Herbie with a rather conservative um, population it really worked and that was a very I think very healing almost healing program pro process for that village to really see like oh there's so many people around here by now making amazing food growing organic vegetables and um, being curious about that so this really networking effect is super cool and something that we maybe didn't expect to happen that strongly and of course, it works for the consumers as well. They have started, like the people coming to the group started to see it a bit of a social event. Though, well, we all know what also happened in 2020. So the social aspect has been um, 
no, we were in need of trying to minimize that as much as possible. But still, it uh, networking is a very big part of the entire thing. And yeah, 2020 um, pandemic, I actually didn't do an extra slide about it because I assumed everyone was tired of it already. But from a Reiko group perspective, it actually did not that much damage. Um, we were never in the situation in Sweden where the regulations would have for, would have forbidden to have our meetings to um, exchange the products. So it was more like people realized, oh, this is outside. Oh, here it's really easy to keep your distance because there's not so many people. And oh, I can still buy super fresh food even if I don't dare to go into a supermarket. So actually the pandemic has brought more customers to the Reiko groups, which was a bit unexpected in the beginning, but really, really fun and really cool. And um, now we will see. Uh, it's always a bit like a seasonal thing because winter here is not, at least in the south of Sweden, not as snowy as one wants to believe. It's sadly a lot of rain and windy and people are not that motivated to actually go out and pick up their food. So in winter, normally it's a bit of less activity and then picking up in spring with a, yeah, about the peak in summer and then early autumn when there is such a wide range of products available. So there is always a bit of a seasonal fluctuation in um, how many people are attending, but that's that's just the way it is, I would say. Yeah, so there was a lot of good reasons why to actually have these Reiko groups. And um, I would really, it would be really interesting if uh, there would happen to appear groups in Germany. When I did this talk the last time, I got a question if it was comparable to Solavi, Solidarische Landwirtschaft, which I thought I could talk a few um, shortly about. It has some, it has some similarities, but I would say that Reiko groups are a lot easier accessible for farmers than the Solavi. So it's basically everyone can participate. There is not a lot of limitations to what you need to be able to do to sell food on the market. I mean, of course, you need to follow guidelines uh, about food safety and so on, but you don't need to be able to promise to be able to, to deliver, um, for example, eggs all year round. It's totally okay to be there just three or four times per year and the rest of the year you just don't have enough eggs. And um, for the customer, I think different to a Solavi, how I've understood it, you don't need to like have a contract and um, guaranteeing how much you're buying every month so you can stay flexible if it's the end of the month and there's really more month left than money on your bank account, then you just don't buy from the group maybe just that time. But next time you're very welcome to. So in my eyes, Solavi is maybe for farmer more long-term solution, more a bit more stable income situation, but the Reiko groups would allow for a lot more flexibility and um, it's easier to get started. Yeah, um, I only took with me the positive points. Then I sometimes get asked, oh, but isn't it really expensive to buy so well-produced food? And um, the answer is yes and no. A lot of products will be more expensive than in a supermarket, but because you buy directly from the farmer, the farmers are still able to make good prices for really amazing products. So they actually get the money they need to be to 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 work to to make a living from it. 
and um, you still it's it's still affordable and because there is exchange between the groups there's also a bit of a control about costs because the farmers basically need to kind of keep an even level if there's someone selling eggs for a certain price and there's three other people selling a lot cheaper eggs then there will be a discussion between the farmers to actually come um to come to an agreement on a fair price for the eggs and that self-regulatory procedure is really a great thing so from an administrative point of view i or well my group we were never in need of telling someone like you should change your prices or something that is normally taken care of more or less by itself and by the people in it so like yeah like most grassroots movement it really is living from the people and it needs some um, engagement of course but once that is rolling it's a really really great construct i would say and a really great um, thing to do yes let's see yep yep <laughs> i have some sources and there one is called who's holding Cellscope, which is an organization in sweden that is basically something between um uh, a club and some kind of political how to say that political ministry Hmm. <laughs> I'm actually not really sure about the translation there, but um, they had gotten some money from a European Union fund to look into these RIC groups and to see how that could support the rural areas and countryside in Sweden and how farmers could benefit. So they were helping out a bit, like I mentioned earlier, with uh, graphic material and um, yeah, provided, provided some information. 2020 that man money ran out and i think they're no longer providing any kind of help but since their help was very little from the beginning it doesn't seem to affect the groups at all i would say so um it was definitely it was nice that it well, well was there but i wouldn't say that um some kind of support from um, governmental support is definitely not necessary to be successful with these groups. Yeah, and that was uh, my talk for today. I hope I will see everyone later for the question Q&A and would be really great to chat about this. So have a good evening and see you later. Ja, dann sage ich nochmal Dankeschön fürs Zuschauen. Thank you for watching. That was a very interesting talk about um, how to influence um, as a um, consumer. Um, if you have any further questions, you can visit the um, chat in um, Events Hexen, the awesome ADA HGM. You can also use the QR code in this window here down at the right side to get into the room where you can place your questions. Also, wenn ihr noch weitere Fragen habt, dann kommt in den Raum eventshexen.org slash awesome unterstrich ADA HTM. Da werden jetzt auch noch die weiteren Fragen beantwortet. So I think, say thank you to Julia and uh, hopefully see you in the Q&A section. Getting over there. Thank you.